data, interrupted, on official household spending survey, the Hindu. India's official statistical machinery is gearing up to relaunch the All India Household Consumer Expenditure Survey, traditionally undertaken quinquennially, from July 2022. If it fructifies, the result may be known towards the latter half of 2024, provided the government permits the release. The last such survey 2017-18 did not get such a sanction, its results reportedly indicated the first fall in monthly per capita spending by households since 1972-73, with rural households facing a sharper decline compared to 2011-12. The Statistics Ministry had flagged discrepancies, data quality issues and divergences between estimated consumption levels and the actual output of goods and services. While it had sought to scuttle suggestions that unflattering data were being obfuscated, a better course of action would have been to release the data with caveats. It could have argued, for instance, that the numbers, at best, reflect the short-term impact of the bold structural reforms carried out in the year preceding the survey, to formalize the economy, demonetization and the GST. A fresh survey could then have been commissioned later for a clearer picture. This is what the UPA had done in 2011-12 to measure employment and consumer spending levels afresh, after the 2009-10 surveys were affected by the global financial crisis and a severe drought that hit rural incomes. The government had promised to examine the feasibility of a fresh consumer spending survey over 2020-21 and 2021-22 after incorporating all data quality refinements mooted by a panel. One hopes the exact refinements are spelt out upfront in the upcoming survey. Of equal import as providing data comparable with past numbers while factoring in changes in consumption patterns and it may still not be too late to release the previous survey's findings to help assess longer-term trends. The absence of official data on such a critical aspect of the economy, used to estimate poverty levels, rebase GDP, and to make private investment decisions, for over a decade, is damaging to India. Being a free market and transparent democracy distinguished India from the likes of China where official data are read with a pinch of salt. The government's actions, including the delayed release of critical jobs data, have dulled that perception. If anything, such surveys need to be conducted more frequently for more effective policy actions informed by ground realities, no matter how unpleasant they may be. Now, imperfect proxies are deployed to gauge the economy, surmises made about the extinction of extreme poverty, and outlays are tom-tomed without evidence on outcomes. The NSO must be empowered to collect and disseminate more data points, without fear of insinuations about its abilities, or a looming axe on its regular surveys. Article 4 of 12 Victory and Challenge, on re-election of Emmanuel Macron, the Hindu the re-election of Emmanuel Macron in Sunday's presidential race is a relief not just for France's political centrists but also for its allies in Europe and America. The election took place amid crises, high inflation, Russia's invasion of Ukraine that pushed France into a difficult choice of imposing sanctions on Moscow even at the cost of higher energy prices, and growing political disillusionment among the country's youth. The first round had seen the far right rising to its highest ever levels, Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour together gathered more than 30% of votes. Yet, Mr. Macron secured a decisive victory in Sunday's runoff, with 58.5% vote share against Ms. Le Pen's 41.5%, showing that the centre can still hold in France. The banker-turned-politician, who emerged as the surprise champion of French Republican values against an upsurge of far-right populism five years ago, managed to rally the anti-populist base once more. He went to the voters with three broad themes, his administration's economic performance, a defence of France's Republican values and support for European sovereignty. While France's quick return to growth and low unemployment rate helped him project a convincing macroeconomic picture, his attack on Ms. Le Pen as a threat to the French Republican values and the tough line he took on Ukraine allowed him to mobilize the liberal, centre-right and pro-European sections of voters. Mr. Macron's victory offers stability for both France and the EU. But a closer look at the two rounds of elections provides a more complicated picture. The French political landscape, historically dominated by the centre-right conservatives and centre-left socialists, has undergone a major transformation. Mr. Macron has emerged as the poster boy of the centrist bloc, the largely status quoist voters. And his key challenges are from the far right, which has anti-Semitic and islamophobic roots. The third bloc is led by leftist Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who finished third in the first round. The surge of the far right and leftist candidates suggests that there is widespread voter anger towards the establishment. And the far right populists, with their cocktail of anti-establishment welfareism and anti-immigrant rhetoric, seem to be better equipped to tap this anger than the leftists. Ms. Le Pen may not be strong enough, as of now, to capture power, but she was strong enough to pose a credible challenge to Mr. Macron. In his victory speech, Mr. Macron admitted that there is growing anger among sections of the voters towards the political establishment and promised to tackle it. Going forward, his biggest challenge would be to reach out to the disaffected sections of society, address the growing anger in the underbelly of the working classes, and build credible alternatives to the far-right problem. Article 5 of 12 The troubled innings of a Pakistan Prime Minister, the Hindu Imran Khan's brand of populism may well continue to thrive despite his fall, even as Pakistan dreams of a progressive politics. Imran Khan promised to end Pakistan's tryst with corrupt and dynastic politicians. He insisted that his government would restore Pakistan's sovereignty, breaking the International Monetary Fund IMF begging bowl forever, and never again acceding to the role of frontline state in America's wars. He prided himself as a born-again Muslim who would free Pakistani society from the vice-like grip of a decadent Western pop culture. The army has the reins. 
In the end, it was the proverbial elephant in the room that he dared not name Pakistan's preeminent political economic force, the army, that ended his prime ministerial crusade. Mr. Khan may have been formally deposed through a Supreme Court-assisted vote of no confidence in Pakistan's lower house of parliament in early April, but it is an open secret that his fall came after falling foul of the army's top brass which, less than four years earlier, had facilitated his ascent to the country's top elected office. It is said that the generals had planned for Mr. Khan to be in power for two consecutive five-year terms, as it turned out, their patience ran out even before the end of the first one. There is nothing novel about a Pakistani prime minister going out kicking and screaming having lost favour with the army. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, his daughter Benazir Bhutto, and Nawaz Sharif, among others, have all suffered a similar fate. With the exception of the nine-year military regime of General Parvez Musharraf, the Bhuttos and the Sharifs had alternated stints in government for the best part of 30 years before Mr. Khan's ascension as prime minister in 2018. On each occasion, they had agreed to uneasy power-sharing arrangements with the army, only for the army to subsequently engineer their unceremonious downfall. Imran Khan was supposed to be different. A Cricket World Cup winning captain with no political lineage, he represented the perfect foil for unelected apparatuses of the state that, in the revered colonial tradition, vilified politics while eulogizing, clean and efficient, administrative order. When the Musharraf dictatorship collapsed in 2008 under the weight of its own contradictions, ushered out by a lawyer-led street movement, Mr. Khan's grooming by the military establishment began in earnest. In 2013, his Pakistan tehreek e insaf PTI party acquired governmental power for the first time in Watan Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. While victory was formally secured at the ballot box, the establishment joined the fray by cajoling, electables, constituency-level politicians whose primary objective is to sit on the treasury benches, into joining the PTI. By the time the next general election rolled around in 2018, the PTI had enough electables in its ranks to cobble together a coalition, and with it the reins of the federal government. Demographic factors. Yet, the PTI's rise cannot be explained only by the machinations of the unelected apparatuses of state. Pakistan's urban, educated classes have always been enamored by strong men who promise to clean the origin stables. Generals and judges were the archetype, but Imran Khan fit the bill even better. The messiah complex around Imran Khan's persona was greatly enabled by both demographic and technological change. Almost two-thirds of Pakistan's over 220 million people are below the age of 29. This majority has come of age as digitalization has transformed political communication. Able and willing to articulate their political preferences beyond the constraints of socially entrenched patronage networks, many young people believed in the hype around Mr. Khan's persona. These tech-savvy and often militant supporters used social media platforms to propagate the PTI as a genuine alternative to status quo in a manner not dissimilar to other contemporary right-wing populists as diverse as Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Donald Trump. A waning. For the first three years after Imran Khan became prime minister, the army played along. The combination of digitally mobilized PTI supporters and the state's own propaganda machinery translated into ever-intensifying censorship of the media, progressive intellectuals and people's movements, as well as the two main opposition parties, the Pakistan People's Party PPP and the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz PMLN. But dissenting voices refused to go away, while the PTI government predictably made concession after concession to big business including the army run once, and after reneging on its rhetoric about foreign aid, acceded completely to the IMF's arm twisting. The opposition was thus able to stoke public discontent, particularly in the dominant Punjab province where former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif teleconferenced hard-hitting speeches from the comfortable confines of self-exile in London. Yet, given the long leash he had been granted, Imran Khan may still have survived, and even thrived. But the cat was set among the pigeons when, in October 2021, he refused to sign off on a summary issued by Pakistan Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa notifying a new spy chief at the Power Inter Services Intelligence ISI. The story goes that the Prime Minister wanted the incumbent, Lieutenant General Faz Hamid, to retain his office for long enough to see the PTI through another general election. Imran Khan resisted for almost three weeks, eventually acceding to the change. But it was too late, challenging the autonomy of the army proved to be Mr. Khan's death knell. Shehbaz Sharif at the helm. The resulting domino effect eventually culminated in his ouster and Nawaz Sharif's younger brother and three-time Chief Minister of Punjab, Shehbaz Sharif, taking oath as the new Prime Minister. Having historically enjoyed more cordial ties with the establishment than his brother Nawaz Sharif, Shehbaz Sharif will be charged with steadying the ship and getting the country through to the next general election which must take place at the latest by the summer of 2024. But what can be done to steady a ship on permanently choppy waters? In which a bloated national security apparatus acts as an arbiter of politics, where perpetual upward redistribution of wealth implicates all major political players in an exponential debt burden, and where anti-establishment political sentiment tends largely to be captured by reactionary forces, not least of all religious militants. Indeed, even before he was deposed, Imran Khan himself had taken a leaf out of the copybook of the religious right by exclaiming that the opposition parties were conspiring with the United States to unseat him. The palace intrigues that followed could not save him, but his narrative of a Washington-backed regime change has persisted. Intriguingly, while Mr. Khan himself has avoided direct criticism of the army, his supporters have minced no words about the top brass's decision to withdraw support to the PTI and instead patronize the, corrupt, and dynastic, politicians that the Imran Khan phenomenon was supposed to relegate to the dustbin of history once and for all. Thread in the Neighborhood Once upon a time, not so long ago, Pakistan was the black sheep of South Asia. 
a country ruled by generals for half its existence, religion weaponized in the nooks and crannies of society to deadly effect, and a militarized economy perpetually teetering on the brink of collapse. Today, as it grapples with yet another civilian government falling out with the military establishment, Pakistan's predicament is eerily similar to its neighbors. In Sri Lanka, a former army officer has run the country into the ground along with his strong arm brothers, while in India the regime is ever more reliant on the violent sidelining of certain minorities even as its regime of accumulation emissarates bigger segments of a predominantly young population. Populists thrive on the politics of hate. Imran Khan lives on, perhaps in the hope that he can once again win the favor of the army. Only when a genuinely progressive politics takes root within Pakistan's, and, indeed, South Asia's, youthful majority, may we expect a meaningful twist in this sordid tale. Asim Sajjad Akhtar is Associate Professor of Political Economy at Quaid i Azam University, Islamabad, and has been affiliated with progressive political movements in Pakistan for over two decades. Article 6 of 12 The goal of an energy-secure South Asia, the Hindu. South Asia has almost a fourth of the global population living on 5% of the world's landmass. Electricity generation in South Asia has risen exponentially, from 340 terawatt hours TWH in 1990 to 1,500 terawatt hours in 2015. Bangladesh has achieved 100% electrification recently while Bhutan, the Maldives, and Sri Lanka accomplished this in 2019. For India and Afghanistan, the figures are 94.4% and 97.7%, respectively, while for Pakistan it is 73.91%. Bhutan has the cheapest electricity price in South Asia, US $0.036 per kilowatt hour, or KWH while India has the highest, US $0.08 per kilowatt hour. The Bangladesh government has significantly revamped power production resulting in power demands from 4,942 kilowatt hours in 2009 to 25,514 megawatts as of 2022. India is trying to make a transition to renewable energy to provide for 40% of total consumption, while Pakistan is still struggling to reduce power shortage negatively impacting its economy. The electricity policies of South Asian countries aim at providing electricity to every household. The objective is to supply reliable and quality electricity in an efficient manner, at reasonable rates and to protect consumer interests. The issues these address include generation, transmission, distribution, rural electrification, research and development, environmental issues, energy conservation and human resource training. Geographical differences between these countries call for a different approach depending on resources. While India relies heavily on coal, accounting for nearly 55% of its electricity production, 99.9% .9 of Nepal's energy comes from hydropower, 75% of Bangladesh's power production relies on natural gas, and Sri Lanka leans on oil, spending as much as 6% of its GDP on importing oil. Electrification, Growth, SDGs Given that a 0.46% increase in energy consumption leads to a 1% increase in GDP per capita, electrification not only helps in improving lifestyle but also adds to the aggregate economy by improving the nation's GDP. For middle-income countries, the generation of power plays an essential role in the economic growth of the country. More electricity leads to increased investment and economic activities within and outside the country, which is a more feasible option as opposed to other forms of investment such as foreign direct investment. The South Asian nations have greatly benefited from widening electricity coverage across industries and households. For example, 50.3% of Bangladesh's GDP comes from industrial and agricultural sectors which cannot function efficiently without electricity. Nepal's GDP growth of an average of 7.3% since the earthquake in 2015 is due to rapid urbanization aided by increased consumption of electricity. On the other hand, Pakistan suffered a drop in industrialization of textiles by 9.22%, wiping off US $12.4 billion from the industry in 2014 due to power shortages. India leads South Asia in adapting to renewable power, with its annual demand for power increasing by 6%. Solar power-driven electrification in rural Bangladesh is a huge step towards Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is, ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all, by 2030 and engaging more than one, oh, oh, oh female solar entrepreneurs in Sustainable Development Goal 5 which is, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. India's pledge to move 40% of total energy produced to renewable energy is also a big step. Access to electricity improves infrastructure i.e., 9 Sudanese pounds which is, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Energy access helps online education through affordable internet for Sudanese pounds, or ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all, more people are employed, one Sudanese pound, no poverty, and are able to access tech-based health solutions three Sudanese pounds, or ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Green growth, green energy. South Asian leaders are increasingly focused on efficient, innovative and advanced methods of energy production for 100% electrification. Prime Minister Narendra Modi in his, Net Zero by 2070, pledge at COP26 in Glasgow asserted India's target to increase the capacity of renewable energy from 450 gigawatts to 500 gigawatts by 2030. South Asia has vast renewable energy resources, hydropower, solar, wind, geothermal and biomass, which can be harnessed for domestic use as well as regional power trade. The first ever clean development mechanism, CDM benefits such as poverty reduction, energy efficiency and improved quality of life were realized when there was India-Bhutan hydro trade in 2010. 
the region is moving towards green growth and energy as India hosts the International Solar Alliance. In Bangladesh, rural places that are unreachable with traditional grid-based electricity have 45% of their power needs met through a rooftop solar panel program which is emulated in other parts of the world. This is an important step in achieving Bangladesh's nationally determined contributions target of 10% renewable energy of total power production. Regional Energy Trade The South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, prepared the Regional Energy Cooperation Framework in 2014, but its implementation is questionable. However, there are a number of bilateral and multilateral energy trade agreements such as the India-Nepal Petroleum Pipeline Deal, the India-Bhutan Hydroelectric Joint Venture, the Myanmar-Bangladesh-India Gas Pipeline, the Bangladesh-Bhutan-India-Nepal BBIN, Sub-Regional Framework for Energy Cooperation, and the Turkmenistan-Afghanistan-Pakistan-India TAPI Pipeline, rumored to be extended to Bangladesh. South Asia's regional geopolitics is determined by the conflation of identity, politics, and international borders. Transnational energy projects would thus engage with multiple social and additional issues which is a major limitation for peaceful energy trade. If energy trade is linked and perceived through the lens of conflict resolution and peace building, then a regional security approach with a broader group of stakeholders could help smoothen the energy trade process. The current participation in cross-border projects has been restricted to respective tasks, among Bhutan and India or Nepal and India. It is only now that power-sharing projects among the three nations, Nepal, India, and Bangladesh, have been deemed conceivable. India exports 1,200 megawatts of electricity to Bangladesh, sufficient for almost 25% of the daily energy demand, with a significant amount from the Kokrajhar power plant in Assam worth US $470 million. Bhutan exports 70% of its own hydropowered electricity to India worth almost US $100 million. Nepal on the other hand, not only sells its surplus hydroelectricity to India but also exported fossil fuel to India worth US $1.2 billion. What is needed? South Asia is reinforcing its transmission and distribution frameworks to cater to growing energy demand not only through the expansion of power grids but also by boosting green energy such as solar power or hydroelectricity. Going forward, resilient energy frameworks are what are needed such as better building design practices, climate-proof infrastructure, a flexible monetary framework, and an integrated resource plan that supports renewable energy innovation. Government alone cannot be the provider of reliable and secure energy frameworks, and private sector investment is crucial. In 2022, private financing accounted for 44% of household power in Bangladesh, 48.5% in India, and 53% in Pakistan. Public-private partnership can be a harbinger in meeting the energy transition challenges for the world's most populous region. Syed Munir Khusru is chairman of the international think tank, the Institute for Policy, Advocacy, and Governance IPAG, New Delhi, India with a presence in Dhaka, Melbourne, Vienna and Dubai. Email, munir.khusru at ipak.org. Article 7 of 12 The New Violent India, the Hindu What was isolated and seen as aberrations in India is now in plain sight in the 21st century, begging the question if we are truly modern. A picture on social media last week said so much about India today. Wasim Sheikh of Khargon in Madhya Pradesh stands in front of a piece of land cleared of a settlement. Shaks, Gumti, or tiny grocery shop was razed to the ground on April 11th because he was said to have thrown stones during a communal riot a day earlier. Sheikh has no arms, he lost them in an accident in 2005. This does not matter. He is a Muslim in an area where there was violence and that is enough reason for the state to destroy his only source of income. This is where India is heading, or where India has already reached. A society seemingly without humanity, which is violent, targets minorities, and has the state acting above the law. B. Naya, India. A. Naya, India is one of revenge and hate towards an imagined other. It is one where governments do not administer the law but flout it. It is one where, across India, gangs go about terrorizing Muslims and if a riot ensues, the administration follows by destroying homes and workplaces of Muslims. It is one where the leadership of the dominant political party is silent, because this violence solidifies hate and reaps electoral dividends. It is one where the police seek guidance not to uphold peace but from what the political mood wants of it. It is one where the victims of violence are turned into suspects and thrown into jail without bail. It is one where courts often look the other way, or do nothing more than wrap governments on the knuckles. And it is one where across all classes, those who are otherwise recognized as decent people feel a sense of satisfaction and even take pleasure at this violence against their fellow citizens. This is where we are as we celebrate 75 years as an independent nation. The demolition of law, which is the best way to describe this bulldozer violence, comes with a fig leaf of legitimacy, of the clearing of illegally occupied land. This everyone knows is only a cover for the fake news factories and the WhatsApp university to argue that the law must follow its course. This form of governance is supposed to have made the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh very popular. Now others are copying it. Gujarat is practicing it and Madhya Pradesh has enthusiastically followed in both states head to the polls over the next 18 months. This new weapon reached Delhi last week, where the local administration, citing a technicality, was able to cock a snook at the Supreme Court, no less, for a couple of hours. Also read. Analysis Shivraj Singh Chauhan's Metamorphosis from Plain, Mama, to Bulldozer Mama. The bulldozer violence is the latest step in the march of state-encouraged communal violence across India. It is worsening by the day and what is shocking today becomes routine tomorrow. Lynching and economic boycotts are now passe. New horrors pile on top of the old which have been forgotten. 
Who now remembers the 2015 lynching of Muhammad Akhlaq in Dadri, or the murder of 15-year-old Junaid in 2017 on his way home during Eid? Or even from just seven months ago of Moinul Haq of Assam, shot by the police when clearing encroachments, and whose body was then stomped on by a photographer hired to record the events. Now the open calls for killings of Muslims have become routine. When the first such event took place in Haridwar late last year, the local police were stirred to act half-heartedly. Now a police report in Delhi can boldly claim that such public calls for mass killings are only about protecting one's religion. Do we need to fear mass killings? As many have pointed out, you do not need to organize gruesome single-event communal violence, when the same result can be achieved with 1,000 cuts every day. Across the country, even if mainly in the north and now in Karnataka too, there are gangs of volunteers to whom the work of harassment, intimidation and local killing has been outsourced. They are freelancers, they may not be a part of any political party and they may not receive any directions from political functionaries, but they have absorbed the poison of bigotry and do the work expected of them. Votes on communal lines The actions of these vigilantes whip up hate and fear of the other, which, in turn, consolidates voter support that delivers election after election. It is not welfareism, labhatis, the word in Hindi for beneficiaries of government programs that is deciding elections. It is the consolidation of the vote on communal lines, plain and simple. It is pointless to ask the political leadership to speak out against mob violence when it is a part of a larger political atmosphere that has been harnessed so successfully at the polls. If the mob is now free to target one minority, it will soon be emboldened to go after others. Which religious minority will be next? Which lower caste will be next? The violence of vigilantes that is being carried out under the benign gaze of the state cannot be controlled. Soon it will outgrow its masters and India will end up reaping the whirlwind. Pen pushes like this writer think they can stir people's conscience against the catastrophe that awaits us. But we are mistaken, we are important in the face of this tidal wave of violence that is driven by the ideology of revenge, muscular nationalism and inhumanity. All in the name of, righting historical wrongs. The intense hatred of Muslims that is now being fanned is just another layer on top of the centuries-old violence against Dalits. It has brought to the surface a certain face of India that we did not want to acknowledge. To modify the observations of the historian Upinda Singh, the messages of Shanti, that Mahavira, Buddha, Ashoka and Gandhi preached were exceptions in the history of a couple of thousand years of a violent society. The violence of India is now there for us to see in full force in the 21st century, in what is supposed to be a modern nation governed by an exceptional constitution. There are exceptions and it is those strands of humanity that we must latch onto in hope that we will emerge from this tunnel. Like Madhulika Rajput of Karoli, Rajasthan, who gave protection to a dozen young Muslims and stood up to a gang that sought entry looking for Muslims. Or the young Hindu shopkeeper in Jahangirpuri in Delhi who told a reporter, I am a Hindu, he is a Muslim, we are friends, we help each other in distress, dot the mob is out to destroy our lives. I will stand, even if alone, in front of the masjid to protect it if a bulldozer comes to destroy it. We can only pin our hopes on the strength and conviction of such Hindu brothers and sisters. See Ram Manohar Reddy is editor of the India Forum. Article 8 of 12 Anchoring inflationary expectations, the Hindu Milton Friedman famously said, inflation is taxation without legislation. The impact of inflation, the overall increase in the prices in an economy, is felt by everyone. High inflation adversely affects the poor. Individuals, therefore, form expectations about how prices will behave in the future to take precautions. If they anticipate high inflation, they negotiate wages or rents to compensate against a potential fall in their purchasing power. Increased wages increase the cost of production, making expectations self-fulfilling and, therefore, playing a pivotal role in determining inflation. The RBI released the Inflation Expectation Survey of Households IISH, for March 2022 on April 8. The results on the inflation expectations are based on responses from around 6,000 urban households surveyed in 19 major cities. The release coincides with the completion of two years from the period of the first lockdown in March 2020. The last two years of surveys, therefore, capture individuals' perceptions during the three waves of COVID-19. The survey results present interesting behavioral insights for public policy, particularly from a gender perspective. High inflationary expectations Central banks raise interest rates to anchor high inflationary expectations when temporary price shocks, on account of drought or disruption in global supply chains, entail the risk of getting transmitted into actual inflation. To what extent can a raise in interest rates reduce high inflationary expectations? One must cautiously examine factors behind inflation expectations since any misreading could lead to perverse policy decisions. A significant factor shaping perceptions on inflation are the prices that individuals observe in their daily lives, originally posited by Robert Lucas in his Seminal Islands model. A recent study carried out by Acunto et al., 2020, validates that what agents frequently purchase, instead of those purchased infrequently, shape their perception of the general level of inflation. Goods purchased frequently such as groceries tend to be low-priced and highly volatile in comparison to those which are bought seldom. In other words, the prices of the lower-priced potatoes, milk, or apples frequently purchased shape the aggregate inflation expectations more than that of infrequent purchase of a high-priced car. Therefore, generalizing aggregate inflation expectations for making general views of prices in the economy could be misleading. This insight has implications for gender-based differences in anticipating inflation in the future. Existing literature shows that women have higher inflationary expectations compared to men. 
Economic theories explain this divergence by stating that women are more pessimistic than men, attributing the pessimism to the difference in their innate characteristics, lack of education, financial literacy, and preferences. However, a new study reveals that it is not the innate characteristics as much as the traditional gender roles that explain this divergence. Natural experiments To test its validity, Trends of Inflation Expectations Survey of Households IISH before and after the lockdown period present itself as a crude, natural experiment. Natural experiments are real-life circumstances that can be studied to determine the cause and effect relationship among sections of people with different exposure levels to an assumed causal factor. The authors hypothesize that if traditional gender roles are the primary reasons behind the gender inflation expectation gap, then the lockdown imposed work from home WFH arrangements or loss of employment should contribute in closing this gap. The logic, during the lockdown, people in urban areas lost jobs or remained at home, taking a relatively equal share in the frequent day-to-day -day purchases. Two categories of occupations are studied here, homemakers assumed to be dominated by women, and financial sector employees assumed to be dominated by men. Looking at the trends of the RBI surveys for the period between March 2018 and March 2020, homemakers report higher inflation expectations than financial sector employees. However, this gap has narrowed over the last two years and has almost converged in March 2022. A possible explanation of closing of the gap could be the gradual, experience effect, of male-dominated financial sector employees. Experience effect, contrary to rational expectations theory that assumes individuals base their decisions on the information available to them, is based on the premise that actual personal experiences shape behavior more than being informed about the outcome of the event. Focus, therefore, could be shifted more on the micro-foundations understanding macroeconomic outcomes by studying factors that shape individual behavior and decision-making, for making better policy decisions concerning macroeconomic phenomena. Bhaskar J. Kashyap is Assistant Director, Naiti Ayog. Dr. Arup Mitra is Professor of Economics, Institute of Economic Growth. Article 9 of 12. A. Drop the pin event in Chinese politics, the Hindu. There could be headwinds as the CPC prepares for its 20th Congress in autumn and tracks the China dream. When the Communist Party of China, CPC, held its annual Central Economic Work Conference in December last year, the watchword was, stability. This was reiterated with even greater emphasis at the March 2022 sessions of the National People's Congress, NPC, and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, CPPCC. Path to a review. Later in autumn this year, the CPC will convene its 20th National Party Congress which will see a major turnover in leadership positions. There will be a review of the trajectory towards the realization of the China dream, the rejuvenation of China, its emergence as a fully developed modern and powerful nation and occupying the very center of a transformed international order. The target year is 2049, marking the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic and, therefore, of considerable symbolic significance. Also read. Xi Jinping elected as delegate to CPC Congress, all set to get endorsement for air third term. It is also anticipated that President Xi Jinping will retain his party, state and military leadership positions beyond the tenure tenure informally observed for party leadership positions, in line with the reforms instituted by Deng Xiaoping. This was in the wake of the immense damage to the party and the country unleashed by the then-party chairman Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution, 1966-1976. The Constitution of China was amended to allow only two five-year tenures to the head of state. The objective was to restore the principle of collective leadership and ensure predictable leadership transitions and prevent a cult of personality developing around an ambitious individual leader. The constitution has now been amended again to permit the president to serve beyond a 10-year term and, in theory, indefinitely for life. The party has no fixed term of office for the party general secretary, only an informal norm is in place. In staying on in this position, Xi Jinping will not be violating any party statute. On Xi Jinping's tenure The 20th Party Congress is important because it is expected to endorse the continuance of Mr. Xi as China's top leader. The question is whether he will only get another five-year term or be assured his leadership position for life. The latter will signify that his power is unassailable for the present. A limited extension would indicate that there is opposition in the CPC to his assumption of leadership for life. For other leadership positions, the informal age limit of 68 years has been generally observed even during Mr. Xi's tenure. Also read. China's Communist Party hails, helmsman, she after, historic, plenum. The current premier, Li Keqiang, recently announced at a press conference that he would leave office later this year having completed his tenure tenure. If the informal age limits are observed, then as many as 11 of the 25 members of the Politburo and two of the seven members of the Politburo Standing Committee would have to retire at the 20th Party Congress. The appointments to these top positions, including the naming of a new premier, will give the world an indication of both Xi Jinping's political influence as well as the orientation of China's domestic and external policies over the next phase of China's journey towards the realization of the China dream. Stability implies a predictable and carefully choreographed outcome to the Party Congress. There should neither be black swans nor grey rhinos, both signifying unexpected crises to upset the apple cart. By now, it is clear that no such smooth passage to a celebratory 20th Congress will be possible. In his work report to the NPC, Premier Li Keqiang acknowledged, a comprehensive analysis of evolving dynamics at home and abroad indicates that this year, the risks and challenges for development rise significantly and we must keep pushing to overcome them. A buffeted economy. 
Domestic risks have multiplied as the economy continues to slow down and is being buffeted by severe lockdowns in major cities, disrupting ordinary lives, dislocating production schedules, causing supply chain interruptions and leading to widespread public anger and protests. The case of Shanghai, China's premier industrial and commercial hub and the world's largest container terminal, is of particular concern. The images of ordinary citizens battling public health workers, people begging for food and medical help and generally expressing anger at a government immune to their suffering do not bode well for social stability. And yet, Mr. Xi has publicly defended the very stringent lockdowns. There is a barely concealed controversy within the party leadership over whether such severe measures are necessary. The current party secretary of Shanghai, Li Qiang, is reputed to be close to Mr. Xi, but may be in the doghouse for having failed to check the spread of the infection in the city. He was rumored to be in line to be appointed premier later in the year. This may have become a casualty of COVID-19. The Chinese economy was on a slower trajectory even before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic and the pervasive disruptions that it spawned not only in China but across the world. The decoupling of China's economy from the United States, at least in the high-tech and sensitive sectors, has been a challenge. But Mr. Xi himself attempted to reorient China's economic direction by several key decisions. 1. He tried to bring to heel China's hugely successful and profitable and politically influential privately held commercial multinationals such as Alibaba, Wechat and Didi Chuxing, all in the tech platform category, by introducing several new and strict regulations, especially in the area of data security. Their foreign operations have been brought under close scrutiny and regulation. As a result, nearly US $1.7 trillion of their market capitalization has been wiped out, which would have been treated as an economic disaster in any other major economy. 2. He has hit China's large and expanding property market with similar strict regulatory measures resulting in the near bankruptcy of some of the largest property firms in the country, including Evergrande, which has a huge exposure of US $300 billion. The property sector constitutes around 30% of China's GDP. Chinese banks have made 30% of their loans to housing construction and 60% of all bank loans are backed by property as collateral. In urban areas, 60% of employment is construction-related. Therefore, the cascading effect of a property meltdown throughout the economy can only be imagined. There is another serious vulnerability related to local government financing vehicles, LGFV, which are floated by local governments and municipalities to finance infrastructure and real estate development. The outstandings on this score have gone from US $2.3 trillion in 2013 to $8 trillion at the end of 2020. They are probably even larger today. This is nearly 50% of China's GDP and constitutes an economic vulnerability which is not very visible. The Ukraine War The big uncertainty for China is the fallout from Russia's Ukraine War. Whatever be the eventual outcome, Russia has lost the war even if it continues to win several more battles. One cannot see how reducing Ukraine to virtual rubble can constitute a victory in any practical sense. More importantly, whatever the outcome, Russia will continue to be unplugged from the global trade and financial system still dominated by the West. Western sanctions on Russia will continue and may become even more stringent than they already are. China has condemned sanctions in general but is compelled to observe those whose violation will expose its own firms to secondary sanctions. There are limits to China's, no limits, cooperation with Russia. On balance, the Russian misadventure in Ukraine has exposed China to greater vulnerability in its external relations. The strengthening of the US-led Western alliance, the revival of European unity and the renewed narrative of democracy vs autocracy, implies that Chinese expectations of a steady march towards the China dream, may be belied. Certainly, the prospect of Taiwan returning to the Chinese fold, which is an indispensable component of the China dream, may have receded for the time being. Xi Jinping's position may have weakened but it is unlikely that he will face a serious leadership challenge at the Congress. In an earlier commentary made soon after the release of the landmark Sino-Russian joint statement of February 4, 2022, I had said that China had done a Russia on the US just as, in 1972, with US President Richard Nixon's visit to China, the US had done a China on Russia. This latter-day gambit appears to have failed. To that extent, India has some breathing space to rework its foreign policy calculations. Shyam Saran is a former foreign secretary and a senior fellow, Center for Policy Research, CPR. Article 10 of 12 the Quarrel Over Kuril Islands, the Hindu What are the different claims Russia and Japan assert over the disputed islands? Why has the issue resurfaced again? The story so far, the Russian invasion of Ukraine seems to have brought to the forefront some other disputes that Russia has with the West's allies. On April 22, Japan's diplomatic bluebook for 2022 described the Kuril Islands, which Japan calls the Northern Territories and Russia as the South Kurils, as being under Russia's illegal occupation. This is the first time in about two decades that Japan has used this phrase to describe the dispute over the Kuril Islands. Japan had been using softer language since 2003, saying that the dispute over the islands was the greatest concern in Russia-Japan bilateral ties. What are the Kuril Islands' northern territories? These are a set of four islands situated between the Sea of Okhotsk and the Pacific Ocean near the north of Japan's northernmost prefecture, Hokkaido. Both Moscow and Tokyo claim sovereignty over them though the islands have been under Russian control since the end of World War II. The Soviet Union had seized the islands at the end of World War II and by 1949 had expelled its Japanese residents. Tokyo claims that the disputed islands have been part of Japan since the early 19th century. What lies behind the dispute? 
According to Tokyo, Japan's sovereignty over the islands is confirmed by several treaties like the Shimoda Treaty of 1855, the 1875 Treaty for the Exchange of Sakhalin for the Kuril Islands Treaty of St. Petersburg, and the Potsmouth Treaty of 1905 signed after the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05 which Japan had won. Russia, on the other hand, claims the Yalta Agreement 1945 and the Potsdam Declaration 1945 as proof of its sovereignty and argues that the San Francisco Treaty of 1951 is legal evidence that Japan had acknowledged Russian sovereignty over the islands. Under Article 2 of the treaty, Japan had pronounced all right, title and claim to the Kuril Islands. However, Japan argues that the San Francisco Treaty cannot be used here as the Soviet Union never signed the peace treaty. Japan also refuses to concede that the four disputed islands were in fact part of the Kuril chain. In fact, Japan and Russia are technically still at war because they have not signed a peace treaty after World War II. In 1956, during Japanese Prime Minister Ichiro Hatoyama's visit to the Soviet Union, it was suggested that two of the four islands would be returned to Japan once a peace treaty was signed. However, persisting differences prevented the signing of a peace treaty though the two countries signed the Japan-Soviet Joint Declaration, which restored diplomatic relations between the two nations. The Soviet Union later hardened its position, even refusing to recognize that a territorial dispute existed with Japan. It was only in 1991 during Mikhail Gorbachev's visit to Japan that the USSR recognized that the islands were the subject of a territorial dispute. Have there been attempts at resolution? Since 1991, there have been many attempts to resolve the dispute and sign a peace treaty. The most recent attempt was under Prime Minister Shinzo Abe when joint economic development of the disputed islands was explored. In fact, both countries had agreed to have bilateral negotiations based on the 1956 Japan-Soviet Joint Declaration. Russia was even willing to give back two islands, the Shikotan Island and the Habame Islets, to Japan after the conclusion of a peace treaty as per the 1956 declaration. Japan's attempt to improve ties with Russia was driven by its need to diversify energy sources and Russia by its need to diversify its basket of buyers and bring in foreign investments. But nationalist sentiments on both sides prevented resolution of the dispute. What next? Soon after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Japan made its unhappiness with Russia clear with its foreign minister Hideki Uyama, saying that Russia had, occupied, the southern part of the Kuril Islands, thereby violating international law. Japan has been among the most steadfast of Western allies in denouncing Russian aggression and punishing it with sanctions. The April 22 statement in its diplomatic blue book will further damage relations between the two countries. Japan has probably been spurred by its fears of a Russia-China alliance as Japan itself has territorial disputes and an uneasy history with China. Secondly, Japan might have felt that this is a good opportunity to further isolate Russia and paint it as a habitual offender of international law. Finally, Tokyo might have been prompted to take this position as it feels that the invasion of Ukraine proves that getting back the Kuril Islands is a lost cause. Japan's policy shift on the Kuril Islands will only embitter bilateral relations with Russia while advancing the possibility of its two neighbors, China and Russia, coming together against it. Uma Purushothaman is assistant professor at senior scale at the Department of International Relations, Central University of Kerala. The gist. A set of four islands situated between the Sea of Okhotsk and the Pacific Ocean near the north of Japan's northernmost prefecture, Hokkaido are under dispute as both Moscow and Tokyo claim sovereignty over them. But they have been under Russian control since the end of World War II. In 1956, it was suggested that two of the four islands be returned to Japan once a peace treaty was signed. However, persisting differences prevented the signing of a peace treaty though the two countries signed the Japan-Soviet Joint Declaration, which restored diplomatic relations. Soon after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Japan's foreign minister stated that Russia had occupied the southern part of the Kuril Islands, thereby violating international law. Additionally, Japan's recent diplomatic blue book for 2022 described the Kuril Islands as being under Russia's illegal occupation. Article 11 of 12 Netflix, counting losses and subscribers, the Hindu. Why is the streaming platform losing subscribers? How is it trying to generate more revenue? The story so far, streaming platform Netflix lost 2 lakh subscribers in the first quarter of its financial year and expects to lose another 2 million subscribers in the second quarter. It attributed the losses to geopolitical tensions in Ukraine, increasing competition and issues pertaining to household penetration referring to the consumption of content from a single account in a household and sharing outside the household. The day it communicated the quarterly results, Reuters reported that Netflix's stock fell by 26%. Moreover, it erased about $40 billion of its stock market value. Why has there been a fall in paid subscriptions? Netflix stated that the percentage of its paying membership has not changed much over the years. This is because of the complicated dimension of sharing and freeloading. Netflix sharing is complicated. If a family of four views OTT content on a connected TV any device that enables content streaming on a television, with a standard subscription which commits two profiles, it is difficult to categorize it as sharing. An upgraded package, which allows more devices and profiles, in such a situation may seem unnecessary. This results in lower monetization. Other than connected TVs, Netflix referred to factors they don't directly control, such as adoption of on-demand entertainment and data costs. The streaming platform estimates that in addition to 222 million paying households, Netflix has been shared with over 100 million additional households. While sharing an account within the household is reasonable, Netflix aspires to monetize the additional sharing with people outside the household. 
Earlier in March, Netflix tested features to achieve its monetization ambitions in Chile, Costa Rice and Peru. Standard and premium subscribers were permitted to add sub-accounts of up to two people with separate profiles, personalized recommendations, login and password at an additional payment. It was kept at 2,380 Chilean pesos in Chile, 218 rupees, 2 dollars and 99 cents, 229 rupees and 30 pesos in Costa Rica and 7.9 pence, 162 rupees in Peru. On the global implementation of the program, Netflix said, so, while we won't be able to monetize all of it right now, we believe it's a large shot to midterm opportunity. How has the Russia-Ukraine war affected subscriptions? Netflix lost 7, oh, 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 paid subscribers following the suspension of its services in Russia. The OTT had suspended its services in Russia following the country's invasion of Ukraine. In March, Mr. Neumann, at the Morgan Stanley Technology, Media and Telecom Conference, said the decision was taken in view of the complex operating environment between increasing sanctions and challenges with payment issues. Its businesses in Central and Eastern Europe, the regions nearest to Russia, experienced a slowdown. The Netflix chief financial officer, Sfor, said in a conference call that Russia's invasion of Ukraine had some spillover effect in other parts of EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Clearly the war in Ukraine had a direct impact as Netflix shut down services in Russia and saw ripple effects not only directly in Ukraine but in much of Eastern Europe as the geopolitical landscape has caused stress and a likely move away from entertainment towards news information, ratings agency Moody's stated in its assessment. How is Netflix trying to increase revenue? Netflix increased the prices of its subscriptions between $1 and $2 in the US and Canada. UCA and US and Canada paid net ads of minus 0.6M was largely the result of a price change which is tracking in line with our expectations and is significantly revenue positive, it stated in its quarterly results. In contrast, Netflix had reduced prices in India after Christmas. It informed about, making good progress in APIC Asia-Pacific countries including India alongside Japan, Philippines, Thailand and Taiwan. The gist. Netflix lost 2 lakh subscribers in the first quarter of its financial year. It attributed the losses to geopolitical tensions in Ukraine, increasing competition and issues pertaining to account sharing and freeloading. The streaming platform estimates that in addition to 222 million paying households, Netflix has been shared with over 100 million additional households. It aspires to monetize all these additional households. In each market, Netflix strives to ensure that the product mix incorporates subscription prices and the willingness and ability to pay. This is why subscription prices keep fluctuating at a regional level. Subscription revenues are important for Netflix to reinvest in quality content. This was the reason given for increasing prices in the US in each market, it strives to ensure that the product mix incorporates subscription prices and the willingness and ability to pay while also adhering to the respective market conditions. Therefore, for certain markets, Netflix has increased focus on localization of content and not restricting to just English content. This mechanism provides subscribers with movies and web series that are global in nature like Squid Games, La Casa de Papel, Money Heist and Lupin, among others. Will Netflix include advertisements with its subscription plans? The chairman and president of Netflix Reed Hastings referred to potentially introducing a low-end plan with a layer of advertising. We are trying to figure out over the next year or two. But think of us as quite open to offering even lower prices with advertising as a consumer choice, he told the investors. The advertising mechanism has been deployed by its peer Disney+. Plus. Sphore of Walt Disney, Christine McCarthy had earlier said in the Morgan Stanley conference that there has been an incredible advertiser demand since the launch of Disney+. Plus. Operating as Disney Plus Hotstar in India, its super and premium plans differ on the latter being ad-free, permitting viewing on two additional devices and added video quality. Netflix does not live stream sports unlike its competitors. It would have to therefore, potentially add the advertisement option between or at the terminal points of its web series or movies. Ad-free content is among the many reasons that people opt for subscription-based content viewing. The gamble with the same therefore has put forth mixed opinions. Moody's expects the ad option would help the company expand into heavily populated lower socio-economic regions and reduce churn from economically challenged climates. And relatedly, it stated that subscribers would continue to grow albeit at 